Okay, uh, for today's class, we're going to talk about procedural justice. So um, there are three questions basically I'm going to talk about today. First of all, what exactly is procedural justice? And number two, I'm going to talk about what constitutes a free and fair trial. And number three, I'm going to talk about um, what are the alternatives to trials in general. Okay, so this whole session is practically a subset of the criminal justice system session that we've had before. So sometimes you might have questions related to you know, what is criminalization or where do crimes come from? I think a lot of that has been answered in that class on CJS instead. For today, we're not gonna talk about criminalization as a process. Uh, we're not gonna talk about how does something become a crime, how punishable, uh, what are the qualities behind uh, what goes into punishment and so on. Today, we're gonna talk about the process itself. Um, so um, when it comes to procedural justice, you know, it can refer to a lot of things when it comes to procedural justice. It can come in the form of um, negotiations. It can come in the form of um, how do you resolve something outside of court. But for today's session, the focus will be within the criminal justice system itself. So I'm going to mainly talk about um, the criminal court, uh, court. So for those who are not here for the criminal justice system class, the difference between criminal and civil is actually quite important. So a criminal court is when the state prosecutes you um, and you have a very different burden of proof, which I'll explain in a bit. Whereas when it comes to civil courts, it's between individuals um, instead. So when the state prosecutes you, it's because there is a collective understanding or collective agreement that something is wrong and the state needs to come in to sort of like punish that uh, because everyone agrees that, that is a um, wrong act and these people need to be punished. Whereas when it comes to a civil situation, these are disputes between individuals that many different people have very different reactions on. So uh, the impact out of that, or for example, the damages paid is very dependent on the case or that specific situation rather than what the law has to say um, for it in comparison. But anyway, um, we're going to talk about procedures within um, that criminal court itself. But I'm going to talk about procedural justice uh, in general. But let's talk about the reason why we need to figure, figure out procedural justice. And within that, we can understand what exactly is procedural justice? So in our CGS class, we learn three different uh, reasons or factors that goes into punishment. And the first one is deterrence, and rather than is uh, retribution, and after that, rehabilitation. And under rehabilitation, um, we sort of like understand that it is a two-way street, in the sense that the system in general needs to provide people like sort of like a way for them to actually admit their guilt or grow as an individual um, and leave behind their old identity to craft a new one. Someone who uh, isn't tied to their old wrongdoings or found alternative ways to live in comparison to who they were before in itself. So it's a two-way system in the sense that the system has to provide it and the individual also has to admit the guilt. And one way you create that system or that environment is to provide some kind of procedural justice where you get people to understand that there are systems in place, there are procedures that we have to follow. And when people admit it, oh, well, things are fair or the judgment passed on to me is fair because everyone followed a specific system that I was um, explained about. Like if someone told me how the system works, whatever, I have a rough idea on how it works based on pop culture or based on how the media talks about it and so on. And it's easier for me to accept my punishment because I know what is going to happen to me. And I should have calculated all of this before I committed the crime um, instead. So procedural justice helps with that rehabilitation process. But um, there are times where people might 
you know, question about something, uh, about the court process. So let's say I'm not happy with the sentencing. I'm not happy with the results. At the very least, when you have procedural justice, uh, there is a consistency behind the logic on how it operates in the first place. So let's say uh, I would like to appeal for something that they could look through every single thing and realize that there is a paper trail for me to follow. There is something that I can actually look through because everything followed the procedure instead. Or at the very least, when I'm not happy, I go back and you know I get really angry of a certain punishment and then I try to re-examine things on my own um, and I become more rational because I'm detached from the heat of the moment. And then I learn to accept that. You know, I'm less emotional and I understand the logic behind the judges or juries and how they achieve that outcome. So um, it helps us figure out where we can appeal if there is a failure when it comes to procedure and so on. It helps us um, understand the logic behind things and then we work around that. Uh, if there is a technicality, we understand why that technicality, technicality exists. And I guess when we are a bit more calm, we can eventually understand um, the logic behind the judges in itself. So at the end of the day, procedural justice is when all the parties involved, they are given assurance by the state that there are certain procedures in place. And that sort of like guarantees a fair and impartial decision-making process in it. So if there are disputes within the mechanism, um, so there are disputes within the process, there are mechanisms to facilitate any possible errors. Okay, so there are several components to procedural justice. The first one is where all the parties involved are given a voice. The victims, the witnesses, they need to be given a voice in order for the procedure to make sense. Number two, impartiality. But I think I'll spend more talking about impartiality in the second se section of this session. Uh, thirdly, you know, greater respect to all parties involved. You don't force people to go through things. You don't sort of like demand a confession for things and so on. Um, you treat them as if that they are, I mean, you presume innocence rather than guilt. And you remind, you make sure that everyone is reminded that uh, the language used is respectful. For example, you don't automatically say someone is a convict you call them the accused instead. Um, so respect is given to all parties involved so that people are not treated negatively from the get-go. Make sure that you know, the kangaroo court outside of the formal court system don't have additional ammo from the language used within the court system itself. And then you need transparency. I'll go deeper into this and consistency. Uh, now let's, go, let's talk about um, the whole part about voice itself. Um, so this is where you might have heard of the right of representation. You allow people to actually have a say in how they present their case in general, and you get um, the ability to pick your own lawyers, or if you don't have the resources, you can eventually get state-provided lawyers. But the point is that no one gets punished without any form of representation. At least that is what we convince ourselves, I guess. Of course, there are situations where the representation of the voice is not meaningful at all. Um, and I guess I can share videos a bit later of how um, there are uh, migrants from Mexico who are sent to um, these immigration courts in the United States, but they cannot represent themselves maybe because they don't have like a proper uh, lawyer who could be dedicated to their case, or probably um, they don't even have a lawyer at that moment that they can't speak English, they only speak Spanish, they can't exactly you know, defend themselves in court. And in worst case scenarios, there are situations where these people are minors, they can't defend themselves um, in that situation. Um, but theoretically, or at least in principle, we are supposed to give people a voice uh, make sure that their case is represented in the best way possible and there is no malicious intent by anyone representing them. Um, make sure that whatever perspective they have to a certain situation, someone is there to talk about it and 
maybe the lawyer is not trying to actively sabotaging, sabotaging them instead. So that is from the perspective of the accused, but you can also have witnesses or victims who can also be called into court to give their perspective on the process or the crimes in general. And that is a cornerstone of procedural justice. If any of this element is missing, and there's a possibility that people don't perceive justice um, in this situation. Uh, the second thing that we might want to talk about is impartiality. Um, like I said, I'm going to talk more about this a bit later in the second session. Uh, sorry, the second section of this session in itself. Um, impartiality when, is when judges are expected to be fair, free from whatever biases or influences that people may have. Um, and as what we learned in our class on governance early on, judges are only expected to read and interpret the law. Judges don't write laws and they don't simply throw anything whatsoever. Um, if there are times where judges um, somehow um, have some kind of independence, that is because the law has given them the power of discretion. So for example, if there is no proper punishment ascribed within the law, then the judge would have a discretion on how it happens. So uh, if there is a mandatory minimum, then the judge has to follow through that. The whole point here is that judges only read and interpret the law and they apply it according to case by case basis, whatsoever. Uh, another angle when it comes to impartiality, um, and I guess this is not applicable in many countries, like for example, in Malaysia, um, is that they, they are also jury systems in different you know, criminal systems, criminal justice systems, whatever, um, and they can be pre-selected. So you can always filter out juries that might be biased. Um, so this is why if you were to watch shows like Law and Order, there will always be a period where um, they get to pick and choose who the juries are, they question the credibility of these juries, their characters, um, are they racist or not? Uh, do they have certain biases to the clients? Do they hate the client's character? Um, are they of um, sound mind or not um, in itself? Um, so yeah, it allows um, lawyers to come in and do this whole performance to show that these people are impartial in the first place and everyone can agree um, to a set of juries that they can trust whatsoever, uh, and so on. Um, now, in the context of criminal law, uh, judges are expected to judge based on, uh, or the metric is based on beyond reasonable doubt rather than balance of probabilities. Uh, balance of probabilities is what they use in civil cases, and I'll explain that in a bit. So beyond reasonable doubt, when, well, there's, you cannot have any doubt anymore. It is confirmed that this person actually did the situation. Like, um, you can't muddy the waters anymore because an evidence is so strong in itself. So when someone says that, let's say, for example, uh, Najib is found uh, guilty of a crime, it is not him being guilty because uh, oh, there is some tangential evidence that has led to X, Y, Z, and so on. No, that is not the case. Criminal courts, has a courts have a really high standard. Criminal courts are when judges say, I am no longer doubting the situation. There is only one answer to this, nothing else. Um, and that can be questioned. So it's a very high standard in that case. Versus, let's say, balance of probabilities. Balance of probabilities is when um, one version of events is more probable than the other. So the probability of this happening is high. But criminal courts cannot work on probability. It must work with that assurance. Yes, this person is guilty instead. In civil cases, you can do that because that's like, um, you know, fights between people in comparison. So in civil cases, they might say, the probability of your words hurting my business through your defamation is quite high. And if the probability is convincing, um, then the other person has to pay damages instead. So it's a lower standard, but it's much more reasonable in that sense because it's a conflict between uh, people and the damages. And you can't exactly measure damages like how you would say that, oh, this evidence eventually lead to X, Y, Z, and so on. So crimes need that evidence. 
the reason that why that is the case, why you have reasonable doubt, it is because um, you don't want to send an innocent person to jail, even though the chances are um, low. And that says that someone, sorry, the chances of someone who is guilty escaping is there, but you just don't want to risk it, regardless of who they are. And, you know, it could derail their lives, derail their careers and so on. So you need a really strong guarantee in itself. Um, so this is why uh, we cannot work on probability. But also at the same time, the problem with probability is that it's still dependent on human relations, whatsoever. And you don't want things like bias or character assassination to sort of like um, get into the system. And that probability might harm how a person receives that punishment and that affects their rehabilit rehabilitation instead. So if somebody thinks that, you know, or oh, the probability of them accusing me of this because they hate my character, because I look like the bad guy in this situation, uh, does not mean that I actually did the crime. So that affects how they think about their sentencing and how they refuse to follow through rehabilitation procedures and you get really people who are stubborn throughout the process and they stay longer in jail, or they might go back to their old ways uh, because they don't think through, or they give themselves the excuse and say that the world is against me, and stuff like that. So it needs to be perceived in that sense. Uh, then, of course, you need um, some level of transparency when it comes to procedural justice. The reason why this transparency is important it is because it's not just about uh, you as the person going through the trial. It's also about how you can get other people to perceive it. Uh, yeah, how your friends at home look at your trial and understand things, how things get reported, whatever. Because you might be innocent and acquitted by the courts, but because it's not transparent, Saudi may say that oh, you were got uh, sorry, you were released because of a technicality you were released because of whatever nonsense reasons that the judges bought or the juries bought, or maybe because the juries were not being professional and they were swayed by emotional appeal and your character instead. So people can say, wait a minute, if you're not happy about things, things are transparent. You can see the whole true process instead. So how does it look like? It looks like um, courts having their cases published. So when judges write down the opinions, um, all of that will be punished, including dissenting judges. So sometimes a person might feel like the process is unfair um, and they agree with one single judge and at the very least they can use the words of that one single judge when they talk to people. Like, um, forget about everything else. Look at the logic that this one single judge has. Um, and uh, it's up to you if you want to say this is good or bad or not. There are a lot of people on the side of Najib in his corruption case who decided to use the words of the dissenting judge to explain things. And they can use that as part of their political agitprop or political propaganda in that sense. Um, but anyway, uh, on top of that, you also have greater media scrutiny because sometimes a court case might also have social implications that allows people to have some kind of um, discourse that would eventually change uh, the trajectory of politics. Um, so, for example, if somebody thinks that the law is unfair about something, unfortunately, one of the few ways that people find out how laws are unfair is through all the media that talks about this instead. So you have greater scrutiny of things. Um, in the end. Or some people might feel as if that there is a social angle then they need to interject and there is some commentary that needs to be made on top of this um, in order for things to set straight because someone might be guilty about something um, but maybe the law is unfair or there is a cultural ban to the law or this person is being unfairly punished or there is it might lead to a character assassination when there is a moral justification why they might want to act in a certain way I think a good example of this would probably sum things case, the whole Basika Lajak case in Johor, everything that a lot of people heard her case and they just assume her to be some Chinese woman who were killing Malay people and automatically 
in a lot of people's minds that she's evil because the media has primed people to think in that sense. But procedural justice and transparency allowed the rest of us to take a look at the facts of the case. Of course, what we say may not um, carry any weight in the end result, but there is a social element to it to explain that, uh, oh, this is not a problem with race or a problem with um, Chinese people and drunk driving, but instead it is a problem of poor young kids who have nowhere to go to in the middle of the night. And you, know, you have working class parents who are overworked and they cannot care, take care of their kids all the time. You have these kids going out looking for a release because they live in, I don't know, probably places that are cramped and they don't feel comfortable at home. So they go somewhere. And unfortunately, um, the end result is them cycling down um, highways in the opposite direction that some could think eventually um, had the unfortunate fate of running into instead. And all of that context can only exist if there is some level of transparency within it. And when the media is allowed to attend them, the public is allowed to attend them, um, and so on. Oh yeah, by the way, when it comes to the public attending trials, this is why you would have supporters of certain politicians in court trials, and they try to increase their numbers to show that they have the moral high ground to give moral support. Uh, and they try to sort of like work into the psychology of their opponents or whatsoever and so on. Uh, but transparency allows that because it's important so that people can feel as if that they do have the right support in the situation itself. Um, and then also you have the ability to talk to different groups of people about your case, as long as it doesn't approach contempt of court, I guess, as long as you tell the truth. It will be fine. You will be trans uh, You are allowed to do that. You will at least have transparency with it. Okay. Um, the next thing that you need to consider in procedural justice is consistency. Um, like I said before, um, courts are meant to read and interpret the law. So um, the laws have to be applied in the same way throughout the process. It cannot be applied differently. If it is applied differently, I guess there needs to be a justification, especially um, as why another person might have interpreted things wrongly in the first place. And this is a recorrection of it. But the whole point here is that there is some level of consistency uh, on some level. You have case law that you could actually refer to um, whatsoever. So laws are being read the same. No laws are made up on the spot. Everything has to be based on the books. And at the same time, when a person has multiple charges, you cannot lump everything together. Your charge sheet has to have only one charge um, inside. So courts cannot jump from one crime to another and so on, uh, or else it makes it hard for everyone to follow through the case or it muddies the case and so on. And that could lead to a miscarriage of justice instead, and a case will be dropped. Interestingly enough, this is what happened to some good thing. Um, so um, in her case, um, there were multiple um, charges attached to that single um, charge sheet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that sort of like um, allowed people to sort of, uh, so allowed the judges a reason to drop the case not to mention there's already a very good social reason behind it um, and so on. But the point is that she got off on that technicality and it's important because you don't want someone like Samka Ting to eventually create this perception that the courts are being unfair because they don't follow procedure that was promised unto them in general. Um, but the point is that you have to remain consistent and the guidelines and standards are the same so that all of us can reasonably predict what is going on in that situation. Okay, uh, considering this, I think let's move. I think we can move on to the next part of this session, which is um, what is the right to a free and fair uh, election, and what constitutes that right in the first place.
Okay, so um, this is not an exhaustive list. There are probably many other angles, but this is more like the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, just now, when we're talking about procedural justice, a huge chunk of what I said was applied in the general context. But at this point, I want to talk about it within the context of criminal law instead. Um, so I've spoken about impartial judging. I'm going to talk about having a competent counsel, um, having adequate notice. I'm not going to go deep about adequate notice. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about it here. What I, what I mean by adequate notice is that um, you can't simply say that you need to show up in court tomorrow. And if you don't show up, um, you are evading court orders, etc. No, you have to give people time for that, for them to process it, for them to look for a lawyer, uh, for them to understand what is going on. Things don't happen immediately. It's not like how television makes it to look like where it's really fast. Like when you see law and order, everything is compressed into one episode. No, that's not the case. Um, people do have the adequate notice, maybe 14 days uh, or a month and so on. Uh, then there's the presumption of innocence. I, I won't go in depth in this with the rest of the content. What I mean by presumption of innocence is that um, you cannot assume somebody is automatically guilty. Of course, there's a kangaroo court out there that simply pains people in different ways, whatever. But the language used in court has to be respectful and it cannot be intimidating or disrespectful or you cannot create a situation where the accused feels like you are attacking me at this moment uh, because um, you just don't want them to weaponize it against the court. You want them to think that the court is fair and they're being professional um, in that sense. Um, I'll talk more about confronting witnesses and so on. Um, jury trial, though we don't have that in Malaysia anymore. We abolished jury trial in 1995. I'll explain a bit later why I'm not a big fan of jury trial. Um, and then you have the prosecution who has the burden of proof to prove something. Um, no double jeopardy and the right to appeal. I'll go through the important ones one by one. Okay, so what makes a judge uh, impartial? Um, so just like how we spoke about media impartiality, we're talking about you know, unbiased judges, people who are, who are neutral, uh, who don't have any uh, personal or financial interests with the outcome of the trial. Um, so somebody who is not connected to them in itself. They should also act properly in the sense that they cannot do something that can be perceived or interpreted as prejudicial. So for example, um, a judge cannot go out to have dinner with one party um, and not the other and so on. You have to separate your lives. You have to become a professional. Even if the other person is a public prosecutor and you've known them for the past 25 years, you have to distance yourself and say that, well, um, we cannot be friends. Or if that person is a friend, I have to declare, uh, or at the very least, try to act professional within that moment itself. Um, and they have to maintain a professional relationship um, in that sense. You cannot have private conversations with one party and without the other and so on. You have to be perceived to be fair um, in that sense. Um, also, you cannot be influenced by outside um, um, outside commentary. When, when you're a judge, you have to use um, what you read within the law and the facts of the case. And this is why judges tend to isolate themselves within this period because they don't want to have other commentary going into what they're about to say and changing things instead. And... There are some countries that actually push judges to, uh, by the law, they have to isolate themselves uh, during these cases, uh, in a sense. Um, of course, things are not perfect. Um, there are times people might uh, bring up tangential relationships here and there and so on, sometimes at the very last minute um, before agreeing to judges um, judging or presiding over the case. I think one of the judges in Najib's case 
Um, I think she was questioned about her partiality. I think something to do with husband uh, working in Maybank or something. I forgot the details to that. But the point is that um, it needs to be brought up earlier. Um, and then uh, if don't uh, if it's not brought up earlier, then it's unfair to wait until the end of the trial to say things because everyone assume that you agreed to the procedures of the court instead. Um, okay. Oh, wait, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah, okay, so if you have doubts about you know, the ability for a judge to be impartial, uh, you can get them to recuse themselves, but it should be at the uh, early stages of the case itself. And you need to have a hearing to figure out who should judge over the case and whether they are able to preside over the case after that. All right, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about, and in, this is an important element when it comes to a free and fair trial, uh, is the right to representation, the right to a competent counsel. Um, and so, so you need to have experienced attorneys to represent you um, or at least train in order to do so. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why um, people don't exactly you know, go up to defend themselves throughout the process, probably because um, you might not be trained to do something. So there are obvious things that could probably help you within the case that a lawyer might be able to pay attention to. But because you are not trained, um, you might not realize it instead. And you get punished throughout it and you aren't able to defend themselves. So um, the answer to this, uh, often than not, is to provide e either A, legal aid, or B, uh, appointing state lawyers or public defenders to help people instead. Um, so then they would be able to uh, defend themselves in court or at least have the legal um, legal advice that's related to it or what is going on in general. Um, okay, so there is a bare minimum, of course, we expect from these lawyers. Um, yeah. Okay, the problem with this is that uh, providing competent counsels and providing state lawyers, public defenders, and so on uh, might only be in theory. There is a possibility that some people might not be able to afford um, lawyers that are competent or expert in their respective fields. Um, so they might get thrown judges, sorry, they might get thrown lawyers who might be new or inexperienced, they're still racking up experience before they climb up the ladder, the corporate ladder, and so on. Um, so you would have people who have money, who are rich, who are able to afford high quality representation. And remember, when it comes to criminal courts, the burden of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. So if they are able to create maybe one single doubt in something because of their expert opinions of a very specific situation. For example, maybe this car is only able to do X, Y, Z. So my client cannot actually kill this person when they run on top of them whatsoever. Whatever technical nonsense that might lead to it, that might create doubt. And it might create convincing doubt when you have expert witnesses called in by expert lawyers who's able to get people off the case uh, in a sense. So what would happen here is that um, people who are rich have an easier time or they are able to reduce sentences because of it, because of their expert um, help that they get. Um, or the opposite happens where you have people who get um, lawyers who aren't that good. So that would eventually lead to uh, people more likely accepting plea bargains or people more likely to uh, lose cases because you know they give up um, on certain things. All right. Um, then there is a question on whether we should force everyone to use public defenders, uh, in which I could emphasize, even though uh, there are many um, logical reasons why not. Um, the first one, of course, we spoke about earlier, 
equality. But an angle that I didn't discuss earlier that I want to talk about is that if you force rich people to also care about the quality of lawyers um, or public defenders, um, then they would push for good lawyers to be in the system because they know it is a gamble. They might get good lawyers, they might get bad lawyers. So the best thing for them to do is to make sure, or at least rich people in general, to make sure that um, you raise the tide for all boats instead. But also at the same time, when all lawyers are forced to go through the public system, uh, then they will be made accessible. So if there is a lawyer that is good in murder cases and they could defend people who might be innocent, um, they are also accessible for people who are poor. They're not for the top 1% where certain politicians or uh, CEOs are able to access. Everyone gets to access them. So it creates that great level of accountability within the system too. So the more you put rich people's lives in danger in some sense, the more they will care about procedures and they have the ability to actually improve the system just in case they might have to go through it too. Um, but there are problems, of course, with public defenders um, because it is a public job, or as in it is a government job, part of the civil service in some sense. Um, you don't have a lot of money in that. Um, everyone is very reliant on um, salaries and so on. So you don't actually make a lot of money like being a partner within a law firm. Uh, so you would end up with high caseloads because not many people are interested. And um, unfortunately, uh, the poor end up in these kind of situations more often than the rich. So this could lead to um, lack of attention for certain cases. So there is a possibility that a certain, let's say, a reckless driving case uh, might not be that serious, but because there is no proper attention from the right lawyer, uh, people still get punished anyway. So it will lead to a less effective defense in that sense. Um, but unfortunately, like most government services, um, they struggle with resources instead, uh, unlike, like let's say, private attorneys. So, um, and then also you have uh, lack of control over cases um, itself, or there is a perception of bias considering the fact that because these people work for the government, there is a possibility that uh, their clients might think that, or the accused might think that this person does not have my interests. So they might feel a level of distance from their lawyer and they aren't able to actually communicate properly or form relationships in order to create an effective case. So they're quite hesitant to talk about things instead, knowing that um, this person is working for the government and probably knows a public prosecutor, prosecutor hangs out with the public prosecutor and so on. So they might feel like there's a distance so so that's a problem of public defenders. Whereas when it comes to a private lawyer, sometimes the private lawyer would even try to become good friends with you instead. So you are more willing to talk about the details in case they gain their trust and so on. And you know, public defenders can try to do that, can try to gain your trust, but there's an upper limit on what they can do. But also at the same time, there is an upper limit to their personal attention because they're going to cover like a thousand cases even a short period, and there are many cases that are uh, waiting for lawyers right after that. So then they have to give, give up on a lot of things. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about, again, this part of procedure is that um, the evidence presented in court needs to be obtained legally. Um, so even if like illegally obtained evidence could help you within the process and increase your probability of getting away with things, or illegally obtained evidence might be used against you or whatever. Uh, at the very least, um, courts won't accept them because, you know, for a lot of reasons I'll talk about later. Uh, but in the case of um, the United States, unfortunately, a lot of this slides is very American-centric because a lot of the debates that we're going to have is heavily influenced by American pop culture. Let's be honest with that. Um, so I will be referencing things like the Fourth Amendment and so on, whatsoever. Um, and that uh, that specifically, when it comes to the Fourth Amendment, 
protects you from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. So, so when evidence is obtained illegally or when it goes against your constitutional rights or whatsoever, um, it is normally considered quote unquote tainted, considered to be fruit to the uh, fruit of the poisonous tree in that sense. So it cannot be used to support a person. So um, we have to admit there are cases that might be dismissed because of the illegally obtained evidence, but you also don't want to put people through a situation where they are being constantly harassed. Someone might confess um, and for all you know, the confess confession might not be honest and that confession uh, might have been done through intimidation and you don't want people to live through that. You don't want to have gangsters suddenly showing up at your place uh, demanding a confession from you uh, and so on. You don't want people breaking into your house, stealing things in order to prove stuff uh, because uh, you are encouraging other forms of crimes or intimidation within the process and you don't know when it's going to end when everyone just submits one legal evidence uh, after the other instead. Um, so here are examples of illegally obtained evidence. Um, like I said early on, through illegal search of Caesar, uh, there is a possibility there is evidence found at the backseat of your car, but um, the police didn't have the proper warrant for it. They don't have the right papers for it. Um, or the evidence could be planted there. So in order for this kind of things to um, be to be avoided, you reduce the ability for certain people to plant evidence by discouraging illegal evidence that they might have uh, obtained itself. Um, and then, of course, like I said earlier, coerced confessions. Um, though some people do argue that when it comes to plea bargains to a certain extent, it is some coerced confessions, but this is within the context of a trial. Um, you don't want people to be constantly intimidated and then eventually bringing that up when there is um, someone disputing the results of a court case. So there is no sense of finality within it. Um, the other example is entrapment. For those who have, for those of you who don't know what's entrapment, entrapment is when police officers um, trick you into committing a crime. So for example, they were to dress up as drug dealers and then you buy drugs from them and then you were possessing drugs. Um, the courts cannot use that because it is someone who gave you the drugs or put you into a position that you wouldn't have in the first place because you were induced into it to buy drugs through them. That's why entrapment is illegal in many countries. Um, it's a, um, so cops cannot do this by tricking people and catching people or else a lot of people who wouldn't have thought of doing the crime in the first place um, will go to jail. And it's kind of unfair to push people down that road. It's already bad enough. There are a lot of other circumstances that will lead people to crime. The police should not be one of the factors that lead to that instead. Uh, or you have illegal wiretapping and so on. Um, you want wiretapping to be uh, legal in that sense. Uh, you want wiretapping to only be taken when there's a warrant to it, when surveillance is given by a higher authority or so um, and going back to, uh, I think one of Najib's cases, I forgot, like one of the secretaries hit a uh, hit a recorder somewhere along those lines. Uh, I think it's one of Najib's court cases. I forgot. I have to go back and look up for it. But the whole point here is that um, that person was supposed to, so that person's evidence, uh, I don't think it was accepted or something. I, I've got the details. I have to double check. I have to recheck that. Someone needs to fact check me on that. Uh, but anyway, okay. Next thing I want to talk about is the jury system. So again, we don't have this in Malaysia anymore. We used to have this. 
I think the jury system is flawed. I don't think it's a good idea for us to continue using it. But anyway, a jury system or a jury is a group where you have um, a jury of your peers selected to hear evidence within a legal case and to also you know, give a verdict and so on. Um, and um, you might see this as plot lines. I'm pretty sure there's even a Seinfeld plot line where he has to go on jury duty or something. Uh, where you know they get on jury duty, they know nothing about the law, uh, and so on. And uh, these are random people; they have to do that. That's why you see celebrities also doing jury duty. In that sense. Uh, but anyway, the reason why it happens is because uh, there's this huge paranoia, especially when it comes to the American legal system, about um, governments being biased against people, that the government is always out to get them in general. So having juries in the process um, allows people to have some kind of check and balance. So for example, if my lawyers are able to pick the character of juries or push out people who might be biased, I would feel as if that there, I have some control over my life or throughout the process instead. Um, and then um, citizens would feel that there is control over things and feel that the process is fair. And they can be satisfied rather feeling agitated throughout the trials. Okay, um, the problems that I have with the jury system, uh, well, the most obvious reason is that these people have no training. They have no idea um, the full details of certain things um, and... Um, Sometimes there are technicalities that juries might not understand, or sometimes juries get swayed by emotional appeal. Um, they get influenced by the character of different groups of people. Uh, and because of their lack of training, they don't know how to filter things out and so on. But they can be fair and they might not have biases, but they cannot have the same level of appreciation for um, they cannot have the same level of appreciation for the law as someone who is embedded within the culture and the system. So it's hard for them to explain things, why something is right, why, why something is wrong. So, for example, a judge who knows the logic behind the law and why the law is written in a certain way, they could answer certain curiosities. Why did they decide certain things in this way? Uh, why do they follow through with a certain procedure? Uh, and so on. All of that um, can help people appreciate things better. But juries don't have that training that they cannot provide proper commentary or there is no commentary to base other meta commentary on. So it makes it hard for people to figure out if this person is fair. If you are fair mentally and someone were to sort of like um, interview you throughout the process, ask you what's the logic behind it, um, as an average person, you might not know how to articulate it. Judges might have the ability to do so because they're trained. They have years of experience even before they become a judge. And so, so it harms people's ability to view things to be fair within it. Uh, then, of course, um, there are biases that are explicit and there are biases that are implicit. You may claim to be somebody who is unbiased, but sometimes there are things that people just, you know, the way we react, you know, how we live our lives, so on, would narrow down our personal experiences and they would lead to certain kinds of biases. The media that you consume will lead to certain biases the kind of stories you appreciate, the people would ha you hang around and so on, would influence how you think. Or sometimes uh, you think that you're not racist, but there are rationalized moments of your life. Let's say, for example, when it comes to the probability of someone attacking or mugging another person violently might be affected through the racialized lens that you have that influences all of this uh, in comparison. It's not representative of how um, things are supposed to be played out in itself. 
All right. Um, then the next thing I want to talk about is double jeopardy. So double jeopardy is basically, to keep it simple, it is a legal principle that makes sure that people aren't able to be punished or tried for the same crime twice. So once you go through the process, um, you're done. Because you don't want a situation where even if there is a logical reason why you're going to call them back, you don't want them to be called back constantly. So for example, imagine a world where some could think got off on a technicality uh, because her charge sheet had uh, multiple charges and that is unfair uh, for the fact that you, know, you are talking about multiple crimes um, being accused for here and people jumping here and there or whatsoever. Uh, let's imagine that right after this, people found other evidence and they call her in. And it turns out she's innocent again. And that, but they're not happy. They'll go on and on and on and on again. And it will forever make it hard for some good thing to live a life itself. Um, so it complicates um, the lives of people who might be innocent because you are forever chasing them um, instead. Um, that is practically harassment at that point. So, uh, okay, so let's move on to the third part. What are the alternatives to trials? Okay, okay so um, I think we've spoken about some of this before. We've spoken about alternative dispute resolution um, or out-of-court settlements. Right? So we have plea bargaining. We have alternative dispute resolutions. We have diversion programs. And we have pre-trial motions. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about in detail are plea bargaining and alternative dispute resolution. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about diversion programs. So diversion programs is where you know some jurisdictions uh, would allow uh, people to not go through trial if they do certain things. For example, uh, they don't think you are a serious danger to people, so they probably get you to go into rehab or they get you to go through community service, um, to pay donations here and there, whatever, um, to make up the loss, whatever things and so on. That's why some people don't go to jail. Uh, but in exchange, um, they have their charges dismissed. So they don't go to jail because people expect them to be of good behavior. It's just that certain circumstances have, have led you to this. Or you have a pre-trial motion. So, for example, there are some evidence that are obtained illegally, so you can suppress them. So then there is no proper case to be brought up to court um, instead. Um, so um, let's say, for example, okay, I don't know the details of this, uh, but if you people remember Lim Guan Eng's case, uh, where eventually the courts realized that Lim Guan Eng Lim Guan Eng's case doesn't have sufficient evidence. That is because they went through pre-trial motions and they managed to point out um, or they managed to sort of like drop the case um, in order to, uh, it, to show that there isn't any actual evidence. A lot of the things are trump up charges or there, the evidence that were presented had a political bend to it itself. So I guess you could argue that um, there isn't a case to be made in the first place. Uh, but anyway, um, let's talk about the other two alternatives to trials. The first one, let's talk about plea bargaining itself. Um, so when does plea bargaining happen? Um, and let's admit it that sometimes plea bargaining happens because the prosecution team uh, might not have an airtight case and they might have a hard time figuring out evidence or whatsoever. Um, so what do they do? Unfortunately, some people lie through their teeth and say that we have X, Y, Z evidence. So you may as well um, agree now. Let's not waste the situation, uh, waste our times uh, and waste our resources instead. Um, so they offer a plea bargain to these people. So. Um, another reason why plea bargains still exist is the overburden court system. Sometimes the courts have too many cases they have to worry about. The trials take a long time. Um, 
And this is where the prosecution and defense to say that, you know what, let's not go through this. There's a lot of things that we need to worry about. Let's reduce the case with you know, lower priority. Or sometimes a accused person knows that they're going to jail. And they think that they cannot get out of it. They cannot afford a good lawyer. They don't know what to do. So they ask for a reduced sentence instead. They don't want to risk that longer sentence after realizing how long they're going to spend time in jail. So they're just going to admit it. Okay, I'm going to spend jail time in jail one year. Maybe I can go out with good behavior within the next few months, or I might be able to ask for an alternative instead. So they just admit to their crime. So they get a reduced sentence throughout the process instead. Um, okay. But there is a problem though, when it comes to, uh, sorry, there are multiple problems still when it comes to plea bargaining. The first one is that some people are pressured to get into these kind of things. They feel as if that they should accept the plea bargain, um, even though they are innocent, because they panic. They think that um, they aren't able to find the right evidence to free them in itself. They um, have no idea what other people have as their evidence. So they think that the evidence is. They didn't know that the evidence is weak, so they just accept, thinking that um, everything is too big for me to challenge. Um, I don't want to go through this mental torture for the next few years. I may as well admit it instead. So they feel this huge pressure. Um, so um, this would eventually lead people to just saying that they are guilty, even though they're not instead. Um, or they don't have any appeal options, um, same reason as ever. Or here's the interesting part, is that you have an unequal bargaining power. So for example, the prosecution, um, you know, we're talking about police officers, lawyers, uh, public prosecutors. Uh, you have people like Kamala Harris, who used to be a public prosecutor, no, attorney, gen attorney general, uh, sorry. I think, yeah, public prosecutor and so on. Um, and they're going to determine your lives. And then they would say all sorts of things um, about you or what they know about the case. And they have their whole experience in all of these kind of things. They can withhold uh, information from you or they can pretend that, oh, we're going to be lenient uh, as long as you admit to things instead, etc. Um, so um, this is not an individual consenting to things, but instead, uh, this is an individual. People argue that this is someone being coerced into agreeing uh, into something that they wouldn't have in the first place. Uh, so uh, you might want to avoid being in these situations, I guess. Um, and then you have perceptions of injustice where people feel uh, people might view certain trials as necessary. Uh, and some people might think that, well, we know this person will admit to anything if it means getting it off easy because uh, going through a trial is a huge mental process. So other people might feel as if that there is no justice involved. You may as well go through the whole process instead. All right, okay. So here's another problem. Um, here's the prisoner's dilemma. I don't know if you heard of this dilemma or not, but I decided to use Akasha and Gori as an example here. Uh, because they argue a lot in our WhatsApp group. Okay, all right. So the prisoner's dilemma is when you have two people who um, agree, sorry, two people who are, uh, two people who are sort of like accused of a crime, and then they are put in two different rooms, etc. So you have one cop going into one room and say, um, you know, your friend is doing this, whatever, you may as well confess and so on. Uh, if you confess, you get X, Y, Z. Um, or they might just lie and say that, you know, the other person has already confessed. Uh, are you going to confess instead? Um, so there are a lot of elements involved. The point is that you must decide, they must decide if they should confess 
uh, in order to get a shorter sentence or they stay silent and they risk a longer sentence. Uh, the thing is that, you know, if both of them stay silent, um, both of them would get shorter sentences. But considering the fact that both Akasha and Gori, you know, they, they have so all sorts of imaginations about what the other person will do. Gori would imagine Akasha uh, admitting and he isn't able to shut up when it comes to um, the crime that they were in together. Uh, so she also decides to speak, uh, decide to speak. But for all you know, Akasha might be a good person and realize that uh, he decided to not snitch. And in his head, he thinks that, okay, we may have our differences, but we are UDS. We will stick true together. So unfortunately, Akasha uh, might confess and get eight years, and Gori only gets one year. So it's unfair to Akasha in that sense. Um, and in that situation, there's a possibility Gori might not even go to jail because the court process might have take, been taken, taken a year because you deduct your years uh, from your sentencing for it. For all you know, Gori uh, needs to only spend time in community service, whatever, um, even though both of them robbed the same shop. And Akasha has to spend time in jail uh, while Gori goes away. Um, so it's really hard for people to get the best um, results together because you have no idea what the other person is going through. So that's the other problem with plea bargaining instead. And everything is a black box. They cannot see the processes in comparison. Okay, I'll go through this one quickly about alternative dispute resolutions. Uh, the thing about ADR, oh, I forgot to change the picture here. It's from different slide. Um, the thing about ADR is that it's normally not used in criminal law. It is normally used in uh, civil law instead. Uh, but there are times where um, people do settle things outside of court by admitting that they won't press charges, whatever, as long as you can settle things outside. And it will be good enough for them. Uh, but the whole point here is that um, it can be a quick answer to things, but there are several reasons why ADRs might not be good. Um, the easiest one, is, sorry, the most obvious one is power imbalance. Let's say, for example, when it comes to sexual harassment, the other person might be your boss. Uh, or when it, in the case of domestic violence, it's kind of hard to argue against another person outside the protections of a court if the other person... Um, is related to you and so, or you have families taking sides and the negotiation might not be fair. It all depends on how good your lawyers are. And so, and unlike um, court proceedings, ADRs are not transparent. Everyone has to sign an NDA or non-disclosure agreement that makes it hard for people to eventually uh, agree on things or talk about things in the end. Um, so it might uh, make it hard for you to exonerate yourself in the court of public opinion, in the kangaroo court outside. Um, so yeah, you need that level of transparency. You have to go to courts. Um, of course, there's limited remedies. You can't send person to jail uh, and you can't force the other person to pay sometimes. Um, it's hard to enforce this kind of things. There's a huge pressure to just say yes to everything. Whereas when it comes to a court trial, um, you cannot just fold in and say yes. Uh, you have to go throughout the process and the process would eventually uh, be scrutinized by a lot of people in comparison. And of course, there is limited presidential value as in um, you cannot create legal principles or standards from your case that other people can follow. So a lot of civil cases is very dependent on other civil cases. And let's say that you go through ADR and you settle things out of court. Your cases cannot be used as precedents to help other people. So some people do argue that ADRs are selfish. 
because you only help yourself as an individual. You don't help other people who might also need that specific principle. So it makes it harder for the jobs of other people um, instead. Okay, so why do people still care about ADR then? Well, privacy, um, some people want to maintain their relationships. So for example, um, employer, employee relationship, some people just want to maintain that. Um, and it's fast uh, in comparison to going to court. Going to court takes a lot of time instead. Okay, all right, considering all of that, oh wait, I forgot one more thing. I'll go through this quickly. Uh, restorative justice, you can go and read through the slides as quickly as possible, uh, but restorative justice is an alternative to the whole court process where you get people to come together and talk about their issues and then the state says that we're not gonna press charges in some sense. Uh, so it's an alternative system or sometimes you allow traditional courts to determine things um, or to complement major courts whatsoever. Um, or you might have truth and reconciliation commissions instead. That could also be a form of restorative justice where you don't go through the court systems, things are quick, um, and the focus is not on punishing another person, but the focus is on getting through with things instead. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the debate motions that are related to what I've spoken about today. Uh, the most obvious one, this house would ban plea bargains. This house believes that the burden of proof for criminal cases involving figures in positions of power uh, should be on a balance of probability rather than beyond reasonable doubt. Though I might change the wording of this motion instead. Uh, this house would ban all private defense lawyers and require everyone to be assigned lawyers by the state. This house would allow illegally obtained evidence to be used in court. This house would ban out of court settlements for sexual harassment cases. Um, this house believes that uh, all serious crimes must be tried by juries. This house would end a jury system. This house prefers a world where judges are anonymous. This house would make self-incrimination inadmissible in a court of law. This house believes that post-conflict states should establish truth and reconciliation commissions as opposed to primarily using courts. This house would run minority communities, independent co courts, and this house will abolish all statute of limitations. Okay. Um, that's it for the lecture. I'll share the slides.